the Imperial College Healthcare Trust Public Trust Board. Um, may I just make a couple of opening remarks? Um, uh, just to remind people that in line with guidance received from NHS England, um, we've been operating in a governance light mode during January to en en enable resources to be appropriately focused on the operational pressures facing the trust during December and January. Um, um, uh, and although uh, NEDs have been kept up to speed uh, by our chief executive, and thank you very much for doing that, Tim, um, that has necessitated both um, a combination of committees uh, so we can focus on key matters uh, predominantly to date quality and people and staffing matters uh, so we can keep assurance going in those places but that will also necessitate us running with a um, a, a slightly rev a, a like more revised and focused public board meeting today um, where we will focus on key regulatory requirements and operational and quality issues arising through the recent period. Um, um, this meeting is being held virtually. Those of us who are in the uh, the same location are uh, appropriately socially distanced. Um, and of course, uh, the um, uh, This is being video recorded and will be made available on the Trust's website in slower time. Um, we would want as soon as possible to revert to um, a more traditional uh, set of governance sessions and board meetings, and we will do so as soon as we consider it safe and opportune to do so. Um, uh, but this is a relatively short meeting, uh, and so it would be very helpful if comments could be kept pithy and questions kept targeted. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, members of the public will, of course, still have an opportunity to ask questions at an appropriate time towards the end of the meeting, and I will ask Peter Jenkinson to manage that process on my behalf. Um, so without further ado, I'll move on. Um, Peter, can I ask you to uh, 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 record any apologies that we are aware of for this meeting? So we have apologies from Sagar, who's a many, uh, managing director of um, a Northwest London Pathology. And um, I see that Andy has managed to join us for this meeting. Uh, sorry, Andy uh, Bush who's chair of the Quality Committee, uh, but we recognise that Andy may need to dip out in and out of this meeting due to uh, clinical commitments. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and for the record, does any board member have any further declaration of interest that we may need to be made aware of in the context of this agenda, uh, which hasn't previously been notified to the Secretariat? No, thank you very much indeed. Um, minutes of our meeting held on the 10th of November 2021. These have been circulated. My understanding is no comments or corrections have been notified uh, to the Secretariat. Can I take them as an accurate record of the meeting? Thank you very much indeed. And we note the record of items that we discussed at part two of our board meeting on the 10th of November and our board seminar on the 8th of December 2021. We note that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Peter, may I pass across to you for the run through of matters arising and actions, please? Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, so the first item uh, or the first action was around the um, acute program highlight report that we've taken in uh, in previous board meetings and uh, an agreement that we'd look at how we sort of add a, a generic kind of acute highlight report 
but a localised flavour of that. And to, due to the operational pressures over the last uh, couple of months, so we haven't actioned that, but we will pick that up uh, uh, ahead of March. Um, next action was around the uh, maternity oversight report and uh, uh, TGT has uh, very kindly given a, an update to that and a, a sort of further update to that is we obviously discussed the maternity oversight report at the last um, board committee meeting last week so there's a summary of that uh, in that summary report so it's coming today. Uh, Shall I just run through these and then invite yes, other please. exec colleagues to add to them as we uh, as we go through? Yes, please. please. Um, the next item, uh, the next action was around the integrated quality and performance report, and in particular around never events. And um, Professor Redhead has given a uh, a comprehensive uh, update in terms of the HSIB and their involvement. And again, I think we'll probably pick that up as part of the uh, the report on the agenda. If there's any further questions about that. And there are two actions that arose from questions from the members of the public and in particular sort of uh, individuals' experiences. And um, uh, Professor Sigworth, uh, Sigworth have, has picked those up with those individuals and so they are uh, completed. And then the last action was around uh, uh, equality and diversity. And you'll see that there's a, a more detailed workshop uh, planned for next week that will pick that up. Thank you very much indeed. I don't know whether any of my exec colleagues want to add to uh, to any of those updates i think kevin croft wants to come in kevin yeah thanks bob just um, for the record we've um, postponed that workshop and are working for a date in february uh, given the way for, for response and we've and um, the external experts have agreed to work with us to reschedule that to get their input as well OK, thank you very much indeed. Obviously, a, still a very important thing to happen, but um, I look forward to seeing the output of that. Thank you. Um, if colleagues are content, then um, if we could move on to the Chief Executive Officer's report, please. Thanks, Bob. Um, so uh, colleagues will have the uh, written report if I just um, go through and highlight some of the issues. Obviously, the I suppose key thing that we have been dealing with since the last uh, board meeting has been the uh, wave of Omicron that we have seen um, engulf both London and the country. Um, we have uh, on uh, in, in December we moved to a site-based gold command operational management structure which is what we used during uh, wave one and wave two um, and this actually proven to be um, I think quite a successful way of managing the situation. Um, if I give you the figures from uh, yesterday, we had a total of 197 patients uh, in our hospitals who had uh, tested positive for COVID on this admission, uh, of whom 135 uh, were positive um, uh, at the last test. And that's a reduction. Um, uh, and from uh, the last couple of weeks, we sort of peaked out at about 230 uh, patients. Uh, we've got 20 COVID positive patients in ICU, of whom 12 are ventilated. Um, for context, um, we uh, had 492 inpatients uh, at the height of the COVID pandemic almost exactly a year ago. Uh, and uh, we had at that stage 122 <clears throat> patients uh, in the critical care with COVID. So <clears throat> it is a very different, um, a very different situation. The major uh, operational challenges have been obviously because Omicron has been is a very transmissible virus. Uh, we have had significant levels of staff sickness, uh, which peaked at about uh, uh, six or seven percent. Um, but have now, I'm pleased to say, come down to under 5% as of yesterday, which is um, obviously very good. Um, but of course, again, because of the transmissibility, there was a tendency for um, to have sickness hotspots. So although the total number wasn't um, uh, sort of terribly awful, um, there were units that, that got hit um, very hard. And I have to say the site operational teams have worked really effectively uh, to move uh, people around on a day by day basis to make sure that our ward areas uh, were kept safe. Um, and I uh, 
a huge thank you to all of our uh, staff who have been incredibly flexible and that flexibility on a day by day basis has meant that we haven't had to uh, use uh, any form of compulsory uh, redeployment to areas that people don't work in um, because people have actually uh, been able to to cover informally on short for short periods rather than sort of moving people around. So I think that that has been um, that has been really helpful. Um, the pressure has been very significant, um, but interestingly, the number of patients coming into our hospitals has um, dropped off slightly from sort of September, October, um, and we're now sitting just slightly below uh, where we were in 2019 in terms of attendances. And people will recall that the main increase that we'd seen previously was related to walk-ins to the emergency department. So the, the actual number of attendances hadn't shot up, but the number of people actually, sorry, the number of admissions hadn't actually shot up, but the number of attendances uh, had uh, significantly increased. That's now dropped, although I suspect that we may see some recovery in the numbers now. Um, the complication has obviously been um, the enhanced infection prevention and control measures have meant that we have not been able to use our bed stock as um, efficiently as we would normally. Uh, and so we've had to um, flip uh, various parts of the uh, state to being from being COVID positive areas to um, to medium risk and low risk uh, pathways. And of course, every time you do that, there's a whole process of cleaning and, and various other things that needs to take place. And, and again, I think the um, site teams have done a really, uh, a really commendable job in uh, keeping things going. But we have had to reduce some uh, uh, non-urgent elective activity over the course of the last uh, two or three weeks, but we will be stepping that back up as of next week. Uh, we have maintained um, diagnostic capacity and we have also maintained the number of uh, uh, operations on patients who have P1 and P2, so high priority conditions that need surgery. I think it's worth pointing out, of course, that although we have maintained those uh, levels. There is still some. Uh, there is still some delay uh, in, in some particular areas um, because obviously the demand and the pent up demand uh, from the pandemic um, is still there. And so we are obviously, as we look forward, trying to work out how we can increase further activity in order to um, in order to uh, take account of that uh, demand uh, and and get back on top of weights. So that's a sort of summary of where we currently find ourselves, I guess, on the slope down from the peak of COVID. Uh, and we are now really focusing on how we can think about um, standing back up activity to get on top of some of the uh, long waits and to make sure that we really have got on top of the uh, high priority patients. We have spent a lot of time, um, I think, uh, focusing on um, staff health and well-being because clearly we've only been able to get through this uh, particular uh, period uh, due to the, the um, huge efforts of our staff. Um, we're expanding the staff spaces uh, throughout uh, the uh, the trust. We've got a program of uh, refurbishment of staff spaces. Um, we've got additional counselling sessions which are being used uh, and we're rolling out free uh, break room supplies uh, for the new year. Um, and we've got, um, as people will know, um, uh, a new offer hopefully coming online with our retail food and shops transformation project. So there's quite a lot of stuff going on and we've collected that all up into a, um, a booklet so that everybody um, can quickly identify how they can access both emotional and practical uh, support. Um, we're also very grateful for a small number of armed forces personnel who are at St Mary's um, who have been helping out uh, for the last couple of weeks. Um, and that has been a, um, a really helpful uh, addition. Um, and of course, builds on help we've had previously um, with uh, military personnel helping us in the uh, critical care units. Um, obviously, with the um, 
the Omicron variant, it's given us some new challenges compared to um, the previous um, uh, variants, albeit um, we've not seen as many patients end up in critical care. And the, the key one is the transmissibility of the virus and the fact, of course, that we have a lot of patients in hospital who are either immunocompromised because of the condition they come in with acutely or have a long-term condition where the condition itself or the treatment means they are immunocompromised and so may not make the same response to, um, uh, to the vaccine. So we have a particular responsibility to try and um, make sure that we keep those patients safe. Um, and although the numbers are coming down, it's really important to remember we are still at over a thousand per hundred thousand cases per week in London um, as of last week, probably falling this week. But of course, it's more difficult now to interpret the data because of the change in the PCR regulations. And that's one of the reasons why we, um, along with other hospitals in the sector, took the decision to restrict visiting. It's not something that we did um, lightly. Um, and I'm hopeful now that we are on the downward slope that we will be able to review that um, fairly quickly and to uh, expand um, uh, the visiting. And in the meantime, obviously, ward staff are supporting virtual visits and, and other ways of trying to make sure patients are able to stay in touch with their family and friends. We've obviously continued with the, the vaccination programme. We've got over 90% of our frontline staff having had uh, both uh, standard doses of the COVID-19 vaccination. 87% of staff um, have received the booster. Uh, we've got 61% of the frontline staff having had their flu vaccination. Those are higher than other comparable organisations, but still not as high as we would like. And obviously, um, we do now have the um, new regulations of COVID uh, vaccination as a condition of uh, deployment coming in uh, in April. <clears throat> At the moment, we've got um, 1,100 people that we don't have a record of their vaccination status. And obviously, we will be engaging with them uh, to uh, make sure that they uh, have all the facts and firstly have the opportunity to get their record up to date and, and have all the facts so that we can then um, make sure that everyone's had the opportunity to be vaccinated um, in time. Um, there's a, a bit of detail in the paper about how we're going to manage the process, which obviously will be quite a significant logistical effort for everybody. And you know, the most important thing is to try to do this in a um, open, transparent and sensitive way because it is a difficult uh, policy to implement. Um, it's worth uh, there's notes uh, in the paper on the acute care programme, uh, which continues to try and coordinate the activities of all of the acute trust across northwest London, because as people will know, we are now judged as a sector, not just as individual um, NHS uh, organisations. And so our elective recovery is, uh, for example, going to be judged as a sector, not by organisation. So it is important that we are supporting each other to uh, deliver. Um, we've obviously, over the last couple of months, focused on the surge, and that's worked well. I think we have um, routinely been taking patients into our critical care units from around the sector to make sure that, um, that the units are appropriately decompressed. Um, but obviously now we need to focus on um, how we uh, sort out planned activity. Um, the finances um, are noted in the paper. Um, so we have agreed a break even plan for this year with the ICS, um, which we are confident of uh, delivering. Uh, the capital plan, uh, which is 87.2 million for this uh, year, um, we've spent uh, about 69% uh, of that so far, and we're expecting to meet the capital resource limit for the year, which is good. Uh, and the operational planning for next year, uh, the guidance came out on Christmas Eve, and we are working through that now with other uh, ICS provider organisations uh, to uh, come up with our plans for next year, which will work their way through um, the various uh, committees of this organisation over the next uh, six or eight weeks. Um, we've had no new interactions with the CQC who have cancelled their, uh, their route engagement um, I think we talked earlier in the actions about maternity uh, assurance. I guess one uh, really positive highlight, which was that um, we were 100% compliant with the submission required following the Ockenden report, which is really good. And one of, um, I think, three 
uh, organisations in London to um, get 100%. So that was really, really good uh, news and fantastic work by the team. Uh, final few things. Uh, redevelopment. We hosted a, uh, a visit from Natalie Forrest, who's the lead of the, national, the new hospitals uh, programme uh, in December. Um, and they confirmed their support for our redevelopment uh, programme. Uh, they are working with the Treasury now to try and make sure that the funding envelope for the plans um, across the whole of the country are um, appropriate. Um, and uh, they're hoping to get that signed off uh, this spring, which I think will be very helpful because obviously at the moment there's been a small amount of money allocated in each of the two um, comprehensive spending review time periods, but it's clearly not enough to um, be able to plan the whole 40 hospitals programme. Um, colleagues will know that we've had to uh, relocate some of the Western Eye services um, as a result of a review of fire safety. Um, and we've had to close, therefore, um, large parts of the Western Eye building. Uh, we are um, looking into how we can do remedial work on that building. Um, uh, but at the moment, we've got the emergency department and some of the first floor outpatients working. Um, and the teams, again, have done a very good job of trying to relocate as much of the um, of the activity as possible, mainly to Charing Cross, where there is some space to do that. Um, <clears throat> colleagues will remember we are currently in the middle of the NIHR BRC um, application process. Um, so there will be interviews for that uh, in April. We've got through stage one without any curtailing of the uh, application, which was obviously good news. And it's also good news clearly that we've got um, feed, uh, very positive feedback on, on our latest BRC annual report. Um, and you'll see noted some really interesting uh, and important activities on the research front that have been going on during um, uh, the COVID outbreak, including um, a joint project with Oxford um, to provide an early warning score for primary care uh, and the REACT study, uh, which uh, has been monitoring infection rates and antibody levels uh, throughout the whole population over a long period of time. Um, we've got some other uh, NIHR infrastructures you will note uh, coming up for uh, reapplication, which we're working hard to try and make sure that we get uh, uh, successfully. A couple of really good things, I think, to note. Um, two new NIHR, NIHR grants, one to Jennifer Crowe, who's one of our um, occupational therapists in stroke, and Juliet Albert, who's our specialist FGM midwife, have both got clinical doctoral research fellowships, which provide three years of salary and project funding um, for a PhD. And I think that is really good. And I, I, it does emphasise you know, the the really broad spectrum of academic endeavour across all professions in the trust. And I think that um, nursing and AHPs um, are really beginning to come into their own now in terms of um, some really outstanding uh, work. Uh, Um, in terms of our EDI agenda, this remains a, a really important uh, thing for us. Um, the first cohort of the Calibre programme have now uh, completed the leadership programme. That was uh, for uh, staff with disabilities. Um, and uh, I think uh, was was really, uh, really impressive. Um, and we had the virtual uh, graduation ceremony uh, not so long ago, joined by Katie Urch and Peter Jenkinson here, who are the staff sponsors for that. Um, and we work across um, a whole um, the whole range of issues around EDI, uh, and it, as I say, continues to remain a uh, priority for us. We've now managed to implement um, successfully our um, inclusive recruitment process where, uh, and I'm now receiving regular letters um, on each uh, post um, of band seven and above um, detailing exactly the criteria on which uh, appointments were made and I think that's a helpful thing to do in terms of making people think about how they have um, made a particular appointment <clears throat> and Sim uh, one of our non-executive directors um, is uh, uh, has successfully secured a place on the London Workforce Race Equality Standard Advisors Programme. 
So I think that that is uh, that's also really good. You'll see a list of uh, stakeholders that we've had engagements with since the last trust board meeting. And then finally, just to note, um, Rob Hurd has been appointed as chief executive of the Northwest London Integrated Care System. He comes from North Central London, where he held a similar role, which he was doing on secondment from his job as the chief executive of the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. Um, and he's now taken over from Leslie Watts, who had been doing that role for um, some time. I think the system owes Leslie a uh, substantial debt of gratitude for taking on what was an incredibly challenging role um, at an incredibly challenging time, whilst also uh, managing to keep uh, Chelsea and Westminster uh, on the straight and narrow. So I think she's done a really, uh, really fantastic job. Um, and uh, we will miss her inimitable style of, uh, of uh, managing uh, the ICS. And then finally, just to really emphasise the point about um, the importance of our AHPs, it's really, really lovely to see uh, Dr Justin Rowe, who's the clinical service lead at the National Centre for Airway Reconstruction, um, a speech and language therapist, um, was awarded an MBE in the New Year's Honours list, which was great. And Peter Openshaw, who um, is a Professor of Experimental Medicine at the College and an honorary consultant um, uh, at the Trust. Uh, many people will be familiar with him from the television and the radio. He was awarded a CBE. Uh, and uh, Wendy Barclay, uh, who is the head of the college uh, uh, Department of uh, Infectious Diseases was also awarded a CBE. Um, and uh, Omin Khan, uh, one of our consultants, has been elected as the uh, president elect of the British Thoracic Society. So that's very great. And finally, um, again, really, really nice to see um, Lloyd Nunag, uh, who is a team leader for surgery and oncology in the research team, has become the first ever nurse to be awarded prestigious spots and scholarship to go and study and Claire Hardiman who's head of radiation physics has been awarded the President's Gold Medal for Exceptional Service by the Institute of Physics and Engineering in Medicine. I think it is great to see our staff in the midst of everything else still uh, really focusing on um, uh, delivering outstanding and cutting edge care and research. Sorry, Bob, rather long, rather lengthy this month, but I hope that's given people. No, it's in, 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 important that it was as lengthy as it was, and very fulsome. Thank you very much indeed, and you know, and and you're right to pull out the the apps, the the very impressive result coming out of our response to Ockenden against the backdrop of challenge that people have got now, and then and your point about how how our the width of our research is still being recognised against the backdrop of the pressures that the organisation is undergoing. Very impressive indeed. Thank you. Um, Andy. Yeah, th thank you. I just wanted to pick up and underscore what Tim says. These NIHR PhD fellowships are unbelievably competitive. They really are gold dust. And to get picked, for those two women to pick them up is a fantastic achievement that cannot be over trumpeted. It really is, it really is great to see, to see it. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. Um, any, any other question, point of clarification from any point of the, of Tim's update before we move on? Could, can I can I just ask Tim? Could you could you could you just say a little bit more about your um, hopes for how twenty two twenty three planning will will operate given the given the additionality of sort of an ICS sector layer? Yes, thanks, Bob. I mean, I think the. So clearly, um, we need to um, make sure that as a sector and as indeed as an acute um, collaborative, we have a view across what the uh, requirements are for the whole of the sector, because I think you know, one of the things that we are very aware of is that access to healthcare is not as equal as it could or should be. And we want to try and make sure that we are actively tackling that. Um, but of course, 
every individual organization has a responsibility to make sure that it has a good understanding of what it's expecting to provide, how it's expecting to um, be remunerated for that, and how indeed we can play our part in tackling the uh, the backlog. So at the moment we are working through, and Jazz and the team are working through um, what the potential um, uh, financial models will be next year, which will then help us to work uh, that out. And I think as a sector, we need to be um, trying to make sure that we have really maximised opportunities for collaboration in order to um, get that backlog down. Um, I think it'll be quite a complex task actually over the next um, couple of months, but hopefully by the time we get to um, the February round of board committees, we will have an outline and obviously um, it, it will be important that um, all the board members have taken a view about whether we've landed that correctly or not. Thank you very much indeed. Um, if there's nothing further, colleagues, then thank you very much indeed, Tim. And can we move on to item eight, where we have our integrated quality and performance report. It is here for noting. It is it is it is its usual very fulsome and comprehensive report. Um, I'd invite Julian and Claire to bring out any particular points that they that they want to highlight before I offer the opportunity for board members to ask any questions. Claire, do you want to start? No, Claire, do you want to start, yes. Yes, yeah, we'll do. So I think Tim actually has already given a really good overview in terms of our performance in the context of what's happened over the course of the last couple of months and also what we're focusing on. The one thing that I would just draw out, and in addition to what Tim said, is around our ambulance handover performance, which, um, although it's not quite where we need to be, actually is is very good in terms of performance across London and um, whilst it's part of what the care we want to provide for our patients over the last few weeks it's also been a really important part of our contribution to the wider system as it operates under considerable pressure so just congratulations to the team really for um, achieving those numbers and that was all I wanted to say Julian I don't know whether there's anything you wanted to highlight no thank you Claire I was just going to say that our HSMRs and shimmies have remained low during this period um, I'm pleased to report that our instant reporting rate has continued to rise, which, as you know, is one that we had a focused um, improvement uh, task on, um, and the divisions have worked really hard to keep those, those numbers up, which allows us to remain in a low harm but high reporting culture, which is exactly where we want to be. During this period, I just want to say that we've continued on the work around the NEVER events, and the uh, clinical teams have worked very hard both to, uh, to, to carry on with the action plan that we had put in place to reduce the number of never events. Um, and I'm happy to answer the questions about HCIV as well, so we've used the information coming out of HCIV to inform how we approach our um, never events, and we'll continue to do so into the future. And happy to take any questions, Chairman. Claire, Julian, thank you very much indeed. Well, I, I open it to board colleagues recognising completely the go back to my earlier point that under governance light we did have a very a very thorough quality uh, committee conversation last <coughs> week dealing with much of this um, but if colleagues have any further points of clarification that they'd want to ask feel free so I'm just watching while we sc scroll through the attendance to make sure I'm not missing a hand no okay well thank you very much indeed so on that basis we note that report um, and we move on uh, into uh, the section on trust board committees and as i've said uh, at least for the very short period we have we have uh, we have consolidated um, our committees we have here um, uh, the re a report output from um oh well, rather we don't but we will um, um our uh, our quality and people board committee that met next week, uh, sorry, met last week. Um, I just wonder if either Andy Bush or Sim would like to make any particular comment about um, key aspects of discussion 
in those in that committee. Sim, is there anything in my particular? Um, I think the, the summary speaks for itself, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that I think there was general consensus that we were pleased with the way the Trust had um, dealt with the staff and uh, supported them during this really difficult time. And I think our interest was in how um, well they had received um, all of the all of the action and everything that was put in place, you know, what was the feeling, how did this work for them um, and what have we learned from what we put in place. So I think we're well, well versed um, in what we've done and I'm really pleased to, to see what the Trust was able to implement during that time. Okay, thank you. Um, and Andy, we've heard about the positive uh, outcome from the Ockerden piece, um, and we did consider maternity assurance at last week's committee, uh, in addition to infection control um, up, updates. Is there anything in particular you wanted to highlight for us? I mean, Julian's already highlighted the fact that our reporting has gone up, which is excellent. Um, we also discussed antibiotic stewardship and we received assurances that the Trust, which has an excellent record in, in, as a national example in that field, that we are con we're, they're continuing to monitor this very closely. It was, of course, during a wave of COVID when sick patients come in, the temptation to give intravenous everything to a sick patient is one that can be very difficult to resist, but the infection, the infection service are very much on it, which was good to hear. Nothing else to highlight. The report otherwise speaks for itself. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, if there are no other, ah, sorry, Nick. Uh, just quickly, uh, one of our consultants, Rachel Bartlett, uh, held a meeting of whistleblowers and uh, staff within the trust uh, last week who have uh, sought to um, speak out in challenging circumstances. It was it really very, very interesting. And on Saturday, Bapio Association for uh, Pakistani Indian Origin Doctors and so forth and nurses held a similar national meeting. And because of this, particularly because of the stress on our staff at the moment, uh, we do need to be preactive in helping people to whistleblow, helping people to speak out. We have a hierarchical system in medicine. And it, it, I, I've mentioned this before, I think it would be a good idea for us to have a board, a special board report where we do hear from staff about their experiences of, of speaking out in these circumstances. Okay, Nick, thank you. Uh, uh, Tim, I'm not sure that you, I mean, do you want to respond now? It feels some slight, that's something I'd quite like to discuss possibly with Nick and yourself to take this forward in the most appropriate way, recognising the points that Nick has made. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to have an offline discussion to see what's going to be most helpful. But but thank you very much for for, de for, uh, for raising that, Nick, and we will uh, and and we will make an action on on that to take forward. Thank you. Um, on that basis, may I ask, is there any other business that any board member wishes to raise that we haven't covered? No, then thank you very much indeed. In that case, can I pass across to you, Peter, to deal with the section on um, public questions? Okay. Thanks, Chair. So just a, a brief reminder in terms of how we manage uh, questions from the members of public uh, in those board meetings. So we, we've invited people to uh, submit questions ahead of the board meeting. We have a couple of those, so we'll deal with those first. Um, for those members of the public who are present and want to ask a question, can I ask people to raise their hands in the first instance and we'll come, come to you in order of, uh, of the hands. If you can't, for whatever reason, use your hands, then the chat function should now be available. So uh, just put in there that you want to ask a question and we'll, and we'll come to you. So first of all, just in terms of the questions submitted in advance, um, they've been submitted by Meryl Hammer and Jim Greeley. And I, I gather Jim is actually on the call. So rather than read out their questions, I suggest to just go to Jim and he can ask his question himself. Yes, please, Jim, would you like to? Uh, uh, yes, indeed. And apologies in advance. 
if my telephone rings, it's that gold dust. My doctor is about to ring me. It doesn't happen often. And I don't dare turn it down for reasons. And Merle is actually with the doctor, which is uh, unprecedented in the last two years. Uh, I'm going to ask Merle's question first, because Tim has partly answered it. That's, uh, there's a commendably high take-up rate of, the, uh, of staff who've taken both jabs and a booster higher than the London average, but there is actually a residual large number who as yet haven't taken up the offer. And given um, uh, given the Secretary of, of, of State for Health, his, his view that people must have a jab um, by the beginning of April, we're wondering operationally, uh, were things to, to not improve in uptake? How does the, the trust plan to deal um, with the effects of non-uptake? Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. I mean, so it's, it's, it's a bit more than the, the Secretary of State's view. It's actually uh, it's, it's actually an amendment to uh, to legislation that was passed in December. So it is it is a legal requirement um, yes. for for people to be double vaccinated by the first of April. I mean, it's a couple of points. You you, you can take a view about whether or not. Um, uh, whether or not making it a legal requirement is the right thing to do. What I would say, and people have heard me say this consistently, is that I do believe that healthcare um, staff should be vaccinated, yes. both for their own protection and for the protection mm -hmm. of the patients that they serve. And as I pointed out earlier, lots of the patients who come into a hospital are in a situation where, for perfectly reasonable biological reasons, they are not able to mount the same sort of antibody responses to COVID yes. that the general population are. So actually, there is a really important role for trying to prevent um, uh, or minimise infections uh, with uh, for patients and a combination of the decrease in um, transmission uh, from vaccination along with all of the other IPC measures that we take is really important. Um, apologies, that sounds slightly like a public information um, broadcast, but I, it is important, to, I guess, for context. In terms of the numbers, you'll have seen the number in the paper, so 1,100 uh, staff we don't yet have a record of. Um, the uh, the process rolls out so clearly in order to be compliant with the um, national advice people need to have been vaccinated had their first vaccination by the beginning of february in order to um, then get through the, the vaccination program by the beginning of april um, and obviously what we've done is to contact people we don't have a, a, an answer from at the moment in terms of their vaccination status um, so that we can get um, as soon as possible after that date in February, a list of people who we know for certain uh, haven't had the vaccine. And then we can work out mm -hmm. um, where that will fit. At this stage, I think it's a bit early to to say clearly once we've got that data on uh, probably something like the 4th or 5th of February, we can then start to to make some quite detailed contingency plans and identify the areas where we think there are going to be potential problems. Um, you'll be obviously aware that that um, part of the rationale, I think, behind this was if you look at social care, where a similar thing was done, mm -hmm. they saw a very substantial uptake in the period between the announcement of the legislation and the deadline. And so I think we will have to wait and see how many people um, choose to have the vaccine. Again, what I've said to, to all of our staff is that I would encourage people to have the vaccine, not because they have to, but because they've looked at the data, they've asked the questions that are about the things that worry them and feel reassured that it's the right thing to do. Um, in terms of contingencies, obviously those detailed plans will be worked out from the beginning of February. Um, we have already been over recruiting to key areas in the trust because we knew obviously with COVID apart from anything else, that um, staffing was likely to be a problem. So so it was better to have more people in post if possible. Um, and, um, and so that will give us some level of uh, resilience. Um, and I think, you know, we, we now just need to work through the process. So I will have a better, uh, clearer idea of where we think we might land, um, probably first or second week of February. Yes. Oh, thank you, Tim. <laughs> Uh, can I ask my second question? Yes, please. Jim. Um, again, it's been partly answered, and um, 
the interims report and on several other people on screen have shown how commendable um, the trust has been in supporting staff over a very, very challenging period. But that challenging period is not over. And it seems to me as um, a member of the public that um, staff who are working to the optimum over a very, very long period of time just burn out. And what are the kind of long-term consequences that the, the trust are thinking about? Because everything you do to hold staff at work, loyalty, etc., seems to be exactly right. But it's not kind of a thing you can go on with forever. And with backlog building up and the new seasonal um, illnesses and so forth, that must be a real challenge. Shall I start on that and then hand it over to uh, to Kevin Croft, of course, um, who um, I know has got more of the detail. So you'll have heard. So firstly, you're absolutely right. This has been a a, a period of unprecedented pressure. Um, I think that one of the things that I have found um, as I've been going around over the last probably six or eight weeks um, <clears throat> around the trust is that. Um, the, the run up to the Omicron wave, I think people found really, really difficult because we'd been there before, if you remember in March of 2020, uh, and again, this time last year, and we'd sat and waited for, for this sort of awful wave to sort of crash over the bowels of the hospital. And, and when it did, it was awful. And that first wave where none of us really knew what to expect with the with the illness, none of us knew how patients would respond. None of us, to be honest, had seen anything like the awful scenes of patients being brought in um, to our emergency departments and having to go almost immediately to the intensive care unit. Um, <clears throat> It was, it, and actually, of course, people on our on our general and acute wards um, being really, really sick. The, I think, strangely, Jim, the um, there has been a slight sense of relief because what hasn't happened is what happened before. Yes. And you know, as I've walked around, the, certainly our general and acute wards, and certainly some of the wards that have been flipped uh, for, to to be their normal job to being on COVID pathways is one of the key things they said is actually the huge difference is that people have not died in the same way that they did previously. Yes. And I think that has, so that has been actually helpful. You're absolutely right that what we did see was, was just before the wave came, people just walked away. There were a number of people who walked away, not large numbers, but some. And I think that the worry is, and people will have heard me say that this at previous board meetings, people process these very traumatic events at different speeds and in different ways and come to different conclusions. And so what we've tried to do is put in place uh, support packages that help people to process what's happened to them. And that's the, I know, the doubling of the counselling services, the, the quite proactive um, offer of counselling and, and other support, emotional support to different parts of the organisation, I think has been to try and help that, help, help that process of people dealing with it. I think we remain really keen to encourage people to take their leave, because I think you do need to have some time away. And even if you're at home, that does make a difference. Just having some downtime with people that you love and who are, you know, you're not having to think about the hospital, I think is really, really important. Um, and I think we have to keep this offer up for a long period of time. I also think, as you know, um, that there is a, a, an important role about making the environment as good as it can be. And with our estate, that presents us with quite considerable challenges. Um, but I'm also very aware that none of that takes away from the fact that there's a huge backlog of patients who have been waiting a long time for treatment, um, that there's a huge backlog of diagnostics that we need to work through. But I think the key piece, I think, for us as a, as a senior management team is to say we're not going to ask people to do things that are superhuman. You know, we are going to ask you to do things that are reasonable yes. uh, and we will try and support you to do those as, as best we can. That's a rather long and waffly answer, but I hope it's given you a, a flavour of how we're approaching it. And uh, Kevin, I don't know if there's any specifics you want to add to that. Um, I don't think there's much left, but the only other thing I'd probably 
add is that last year we converted what would normally be um, appraisal discussions with staff into conversations about their health and well-being and what we could do to support them and we'll be doing that same thing again um, and talking to staff about things like career breaks flexible working you know, do they want some time off those sorts of things to try and give people different options and at least try to retain them in the longer term even if they do need to step away or do something different or want to change jobs in the short term so i think that's the only thing really i'd probably add to everything that tim's mentioned and 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 sort of jim just to finalize hmm. uh, sort of myself and my non-executive colleagues are hugely supportive of the approach that tim and the team yes. are taking in these measures I think all we can say is thank you so much for all of the trust is doing and for for staff who have shown quite enormous resilience and uh, let's hope um, we get through this. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your questions, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Um, I can't see any other hands um, and nor any other comments in the chat. So I suppose last final ask if people have got any questions then. Hands, chat, or even just now, uh, shout out if anyone's got any other questions. No, nope. it would appear that there aren't any other questions, uh, in, Chair. So. In that case, in that case, can I thank you all for your involvement? Can I thank you all for the points you've made and the questions raised and the responses to them? Um, uh, and uh, I'll close the meeting. Uh, our next meeting on, is on the 16th of March. Um, I'm hoping we will be in, in more regularised um, uh, form uh, in then. Uh, thank you all very much indeed. Please stay safe and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Bob.